Welcome back, students. In today's video, we'll be discussing one of the three fundamental states of matter. Along with solids and liquids, we have gases. And for this video, I'll be using this uh, water bottle, plastic water bottle. It has no water in it right now, but that doesn't mean that it's empty because we know it has air in it. And air is a mixture of gases, uh, most predominantly is N2 nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen, which makes up about 78% of air. Another 21% or so of air is oxygen, O2, diatomic oxygen. Another approximately 1% of air is argon, the noble gas argon. And then you have a lot, a lot of other chemicals that are in air. You have carbon dioxide, uh, you might have water vapor, there might be H2O vapor in here. And depending on the area that you're in, you might have some, you might have industrial gases that come from uh, combustion, for example, carbon monoxide from the incomplete combustion of petroleum products or other, uh, other gas components in air. I'm going to close this container, put the little cap on it right here. So we now have an enclosed container. It is not empty, right? It has gas in it and it, uh, it has a mixture of gases right now. So I'm going to be using that uh, to illustrate some of the properties of gases. Because as we start out this uh, chapter, I want to go over some of the key observations of the properties of gases. And once I've covered some of the key observable properties of gases, then we'll put them all together in, into what's called the kinetic molecular theory, or the KMT, of gases that helps to explain these observations. So first of all, we're going to be dealing with four observable properties of gases. The first observable property of gases is that gases assume the volume and shape of their container. The volume and the shape of their containers. Now, we may not be able to see the gas in here so we don't know which volume it's occupying or which shape it's taking. But if I were to insert a little needle from a, from a gas syringe into the top here, I could extract a little sample from the top, and I could extract a little sample from the bottom, and I could run analysis on it through something like a gas chromatograph, and I could see that the gas is occupying space up here and down here, and in fact it's occupying all over this space. So even though the gas is invisible, I can tell through experimentation that the gas is filling up this whole container space. So it's occupying the whole volume of the container, and it's expanded to take the shape of that container as well. Okay. So gases assume the volume and shape of their container. That's one of our observable properties. And the next observable property of gases are that gases are compressible. So if this were filled with water, if this bottle were filled with water, I would not be able to compress it to that degree. So that is a sign that gases can be compressed. And let's note the spelling here. C-O-M-P-R-E-S-S, -S, compress, I-B-L-E, compressible. That means you can compress them or squeeze them tighter to fill up a smaller volume. So that's an observable property of gases. The third observable property of gases are that gases are less dense. than solids and liquids. So we know that if I were to take this enclosed uh, water bottle here and put it in a, a bucket of water, it would float because the gas inside the bottle is less dense than the water below it. 
and so it is not enough density to be able to displace the water. It has buoyancy. So gases are less dense than solids. And through other experimentation, we can see that their density is related to their temperature. So as the gas gets hotter, we find that it's less dense. And that's actually the underlying principle behind the hot air balloon. So the hot air balloon has air inside the big balloon. And then there is a burner down here that emits a flame that shoots up into this balloon and heats up the air inside the balloon. And as the air inside the balloon becomes warmer, then it becomes less dense than the air outside the balloon. And so the air inside the balloon that's less dense will float on the air that is outside the balloon that is more dense. And that's how hot air balloons work. So this is, a, this is an observable property of gases, that gases are less dense than solids and liquids, and that their density is related to their temperature. Finally, one more observable property of gases is that gases can form homogeneous mixtures. with other gases in any proportion. So inside this, this uh, bottle of gas mixture now, I have a mixture of nitrogen gas, N2, oxygen gas, O2, argon gas, carbon dioxide, CO2. I probably have water vapor, H2O, and some other gases that are in here. And they have all formed a homogeneous mixture. Remember, a homogeneous mixture is a mixture that has a uniform consistency throughout the sample. And it wouldn't matter if I had twice as much oxygen in here or half as much oxygen in here. In whatever proportions I had those mixtures in there, they would be able to form a homogeneous mixture. And how do I observe that? Again, I could take samples from various places in this container and run analysis on them, and I would be able to see that they are the, the mixture is, has a uniform consistency throughout the sample. So those are four key observable properties of gases. Now there's got to be a theory that explains why gases behave this way. Why do gases have these properties? And there is. It's been developed over many years, and it is now known as the kinetic molecular theory of gases, or the KMT. So the theory, the KMT, that explains our observable properties of a gas has four postulates. A postulate is a statement that explains some aspect of the theory. So one of the postulates relates to the separation between the gas particles. And the postulate says that gas is made of particles that are relatively far apart. They're relatively far apart from each other, and therefore they are compressible. The reason that I can compress this is because the gas particles that are inside here have space in between them. If each gas particle were right next to each other, like you find in a solid or liquid, there would be less space to be able to compress it in. And so one of the postulates of the theory of the KMT is that these gas particles actually have space in between them and their neighbors. So that's what we mean by relatively far apart. Now, it's not an inch 
or a, a centimeter far apart, we're still talking about an atomic scale, right? It's a very, very small distance. But compared to a solid or a liquid, these gas particles, and by gas particles I mean a molecule, for example, like N2, they are very far apart from their neighbors, relatively speaking. So that separation of gas particles is a, one of the postulates, and it explains why gases are compressible when solids and liquids are less compressible. Another postulate of the KMT theory has to do with the motion of gas particles in a container. And the postulate says that molecules, the gas particles, are in constant motion. And they travel in a straight line, and they're going in random directions, and they will collide. with each other. That means they will bump into each other and they will bump into or collide with a container wall and when they do that they will transfer energy either to the other molecules that they bumped into or the container wall. So an, a way to describe this, a way to draw this, I'm gonna draw my little bottle here and my bottle is gonna be closed. I'm gonna put a lid on it there and I'm gonna have I'm going to draw these really large. These are large molecules, right? Because we normally can't see molecules. But I'm just going to draw a few of them there to illustrate what this concept is saying. So these molecules are in constant motion. They're always moving. They are moving in a straight line and in random directions. So this one might be going that direction. That one's going there. That one's going that way. And so forth. Got the idea? So that is a postulate of the KMT, that gas molecules are all in constant motion in a straight line and they're going in random directions. And because they are headed in some direction, they will eventually collide with something. It might be another gas molecule, or it might be the side of the wall of the container that they're in. And when they collide with something, they're going to transfer some energy to it. The same way that when you're playing billiards or pool and one ball hits another, it will transfer some energy to it. All right, the third key postulate of the kinetic molecular theory of gases has to do with their interactions. Now, there are all kinds of interactions that gas molecules make between each other. But we are going to pretend, in order to simplify our model here, our explanation, we're going to pretend that these are ideal gases. So they are behaving according to a, an idealized or perfect model. And gases don't really behave this way. But we're going to simplify our model by calling them ideal. So these ideal gas molecules, otherwise they don't interact with each other. They don't interact. They don't attract each other. They don't repel each other. They don't stick to each other when they collide and so forth. So they otherwise don't interact with each other except to collide with each other. They don't interact except to collide with each other. Now in reality, yes, as I say, gas molecules do have all kinds of interactions, but we're going to pretend to simplify our model that they're ideal gases and they're not going to interact except when they collide with each other and then they'll just bounce right off of each other. Okay, and the last postulate that I want to emphasize here is related to uh, the energy of the sample. And this postulate says that gas particles have a distribution of kinetic energies. What does that mean? 
Well, a distribution of kinetic energies means that for every sample that you may have, for example, if I've got a sample of gas here, there are some gas molecules in there that are traveling very slowly. And so they have very low energy, very low kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And in the same sample, there are gas molecules that are very, traveling very quickly. And if you're traveling very quickly, then you have a higher kinetic energy. So there are gas molecules in this sample that have high energy and low energy and somewhere in between. So this is called a distribution. A distribution means there are some that have high energy, some that have low energy. So an easy way to illustrate a distribution is to draw a little graph. And so we can say on the y-axis we have the number of molecules and on the x-axis we can say the energy, this is mainly the kinetic energy. And in this particular sample that we're talking about, I have some very small number of molecules that have a very low energy. And then as I get to a higher energy, there are more molecules that have higher energy. And then I have a small number of molecules that have a very high energy. So this is a single sample of gas. It represents the sample of gas that is in this bottle. There are some molecules with a low energy. There are some molecules with a high energy. But most of the molecules have some medium amount of energy. This is a larger number of molecules have a medium amount of energy. So that's a distribution. It's a statistical distribution, right? So this graph is representing a statistical distribution of the number of molecules with a particular amount of kinetic energy. So why is this important? Well, it's important in a couple of ways. What it means is that whenever you have a sample of gas, there's always going to be some molecules traveling slower and some molecules traveling higher than the average speed. And so there's a statistical distribution of speeds and of energy, therefore of kinetic energy. The second important aspect of this is that whatever the average kinetic energy is of the sample, that can be reported to, or it is related to, temperature. So, that's what this second statement is getting at. The average kinetic energy of a gas, of a sample of gas, is related to its temperature. So I just want to point out something really quick. Let's say we have this sample of gas at a particular temperature. And it is at a particular temperature right now. It's approximately 23 degrees Celsius, which is a nice room temperature here. And so that temperature does not tell me the, ener the energy of every gas molecule. It tells me only the average of the energies. And even though the sample overall is at a particular temperature, there are going to be many molecules in that sample that have lower energies and many molecules in the sample that have higher energies. So those are the four key postulates of the kinetic molecular theory. And they're going to help us understand the nature of the observations that we made earlier.